Welcome back to Bombastic Nation, the thing and thing and thing. I'm Mr. Giant, and I'm back with some more vibes for all you. Yes, I. Man, I hope everything is good where you are and thing. You know what I mean? I'm having a good year so far. It's been it's been a pretty uh interesting year. Maybe one day I'll do a video explaining what makes this year so interesting. But you know. Let me thank you guys for watching this, you know, and uh, like the video, you know, share the video and comment. Drop more, uh, more suggestions in there and I'll watch it. I'm trying to get to them. Like I said, I work a nine to five, so I'm trying to get to them as much as I could. I have to go through there and just see the ones that were asked of me and do them. But I do believe that I finally have the Napoleon thing figured out. This one here, uh, as far as I can tell, is the very first one. And it's called Napoleon's First Victory. I'm going, I'm going. <laughs> uh, Siege of Toulon, 1793. So, you see, I started off in like 1812 or something like that. And, you know, it started, yeah. And what I did is I researched it and I looked and I looked and I found like a whole group of them. And it started and it went by the years. So, I'm assuming I'm right this time. God, I hope I'm right. So I could deliver this uh, Napoleon thing here. So I ain't going to keep babbling. Let's go ahead and YouTube and Sim Simmer because I've been excited to watch this uh, Napoleon uh, series. An Epic History TV History March collaboration. Supported by our sponsor, Osprey Publishing. In the summer of 1793, the beginnings of the French Napoleon. Revolution was entering its fourth year, and France was on the verge of wait, 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 wait. Did he say the French Revolution was entering its fourth year? Man, they had to fight four years to, to have the revolution. I mean, shoot, we had a revolution. <laughs> Our revolution took two days. <laughs> I ain't even joking here. You know what I mean? And it wasn't a bloody revolution. I do believe that only one person died on the day of the revolution. Just one. But he just said four years. Man. Okay. 1993, the French Revolution was entering its fourth year. He did say fourth France year. France was on wow. the verge of anarchy. In Paris, political extremists had seized control of the revolution. They guillotined the king and imposed a reign of terror that dealt summary justice. Who came up with the idea of the guillotine? I mean, that is a crazy idea to come up with a, something like that. You know what I mean? We did some crazy stuff back then, and I guess we're supposed to be more civilized now. Like, we wouldn't behead somebody and then have somebody running around with the head like this. Or is it just a depiction? You know what I mean? I mean it probably didn't happen like that. Because it seems poor people had the revolution. And, you, and, and and of course, you know, if somebody's going to write about it, they're going to say, look how savage these people are. Not taking into consideration what my mom used to say, a hungry man is an angry man. You you know, you, you, you're going to get some food and, you know, you're going to topple a government if you're not getting the food. To all suspected enemies of the revolution. Hoping to unify the new republic, France's leaders had declared war on the Habsburg Empire. But the conflict quickly widened, and soon France was facing the combined might of Europe's leading powers, determined to stamp out her dangerous political experiment. Meanwhile, whole regions of France had come out in open revolt, horrified by the new extremism of the revolution. In August, the Republic suffered a further, potentially fatal blow, when the city of Toulon joined the revolt. Toulon was France's largest and most important naval base in the south, home to a third of the entire French navy. Wow. But now, rebels that their old enemy, the British Royal Navy, into the port, led by Admiral Lord Hood, aboard HMS Victory. It was an extraordinary coup, 
Without a shot being fired, the Allies had crippled French naval power in the Mediterranean, and gained a vital toehold on the French coast. All French forces in the area were immediately diverted to face this new threat, and lay siege to the rebel port. 19,000 troops in all, but since most French officers had been aristocrats, who were now fleeing the revolution in large numbers, they were seriously short of professional leadership. Their commander, General Jean-Francois Carteau, was a loyal republican, but a court painter by trade, with no military training. What? To make matters worse, one of his few professional officers, his artillery commander, Colonel Don Martin, had been badly wounded on the approach to Toulon. Antoine Salicetti, a Corsican deputy of the National Convention in Paris, recommended as his replacement a fellow countryman, a 24-year-old artillery officer who was passing Toulon en route to the front, named Napoleone Buonaparte. Napoleone Bonaparte. Bonaparte I know was some a stupid doing that, soldier, but I like doing it. But he'd seen almost Sumi. no active service. Nevertheless, Salicetti was impressed by his manner, and most of all, his politics. Bonaparte had just written a political pamphlet, a short story about a young artillery officer who berates his fellow diners for their disloyalty to the Republic. General Carteau thought it wise to accept Deputy Salicetti's recommendation. He started a little monster. <clears throat> I heard that uh, there's always been a story that Napoleon was really short, but I, I've, heard, I've heard reports that he probably wasn't short at all. I guess history wanted to make him look like some little evil guy who uh, was, you know, I guess you could say he was, I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, uh, little man syndrome or something. They want to use a hoodie was average height, especially for that time. The great port of Toulon was well defended by city walls and a dozen outlying forts and redoubts. They were held by 2,000 British soldiers and sailors, 6,000 Spanish troops, 6,000 Neapolitans and 800 Sardinians. Artillery would be the key to overcoming these formidable defences. But when Bonaparte was put in command of the artillery on the 16th of September, he found himself with few cannon, not enough trained gun crews, and a shortage of gunpowder and shot. With relentless energy and determination, Bonaparte transformed the situation, requisitioning unused guns, training infantrymen to work them, setting up a new forge and workshop, and arranging transport from Marseille of 100,000 sandbags for constructing new batteries. Through hard work, he was ultimately able to build his force up to 64 officers and 1,500 men. Wow, that is 24. Howitzers and mortars. Within days, Bonaparte had established two new forward batteries with good revolutionary names, La Montagne and Sans Culottes, which brought Toulon's inner harbour within range and forced Admiral Hood to move all his ships closer to the port. Bonaparte also came up with a plan, one that would allow the French to bypass most of Toulon's defences and secure the rapid victory the Republic so desperately needed. Bonaparte argued that if Fort Leguilette could be captured, which looked out across the harbour, he could fill it with heavy guns and shell the British and Spanish fleet at anchor. Admiral Hood would be forced to abandon the port. <laughs> Sorry, I went like this. It's like a saucer of move. I don't know if it was an eyelash or something moving, but something just moved, like real close to me. And take with him the Allied soldiers that Toulon relied on for its defence. 
General Carteau saw the merits of Bonaparte's plan, and on the 22nd of September, French forces attacked Montcaire. But to Bonaparte's exasperation, while he'd argued for an attack by 3,000 men, the indecisive Carteau committed only 400. Not only was the attack easily repulsed, but it alerted the Allies to the danger. Within 48 hours, they'd reinforced Montcaire with thousands more troops and built a new fort named Fort Mulgrave, bristling with 20 cannon. The position was now so strong, the French nicknamed it Little Gibraltar. Finally, in mid-November, an experienced professional soldier arrived to take command of French forces, General Dugommier. He saw at once that Bonaparte's plan was the only way to take Toulon, and gave it his full backing. Bonaparte, promoted to major, got to work, overseeing construction of several more batteries in preparation for the decisive assault. One forward battery was so exposed to enemy fire that men refused to be sent there. So Bonaparte renamed it La Batterie des Hommes Sans Peur, the Battery of Men Without Fear. And suddenly there was no shortage of volunteers. Oh man! Hey man! Oh, this dude, he used a play on words and they're like, okay, I'll do it. It's a place for where, you know, the testosterone is high and men uh, have no fear. Let's go there. <laughs> and people are just like, I'll go. No fear. I'm in. Yes, for inspiring his soldiers. One that would serve him well in the years ahead. On the 30th of November, the Allied Land Forces commander British General Charles O'Hara tried to seize back the initiative, leading an assault on the new French batteries facing Fort Malbousquet. At first the attack was successful. The batteries were overrun, and the French guns spiked. But a counter-attack with much greater numbers, and led in person by General Dugommier and Major Bonaparte, drove back the Allies. Make all that progress and then to turn and run. General O'Hara himself was shot through the hand and captured. Twelve years before, he'd surrendered to George Washington at Yorktown during the American War of Independence. Wow. Now he got to surrender to Napoleon Bonaparte. Man, that's a distinguished uh, uh, place in history to have. Defeated in America, defeated in France, shot him in France. In the early hours of the 18th of December, in howling wind and driving rain, the French launched a major assault on Fort Mulgrave. The wet conditions made muskets useless, except as clubs or with bayonets. Bonaparte led the second wave in person. Amid fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting, his horse was killed under him, and he was bayoneted in the thigh by a British sergeant, a wound that came within inches of ending his life and radically changing the course of history. True sure that. Finally, the Allied garrison was overwhelmed, and Mulgrave fell to the French. Fort Leguilet and Tour de la Balakière were soon also in French hands. By the following afternoon, the French had ten heavy guns in Leguilet, placing the Allied ships within range. Admiral Hood could not expose his valuable ships of the line to such a threat. He had no option but to order an immediate evacuation of the fleet and garrison from Toulon. 
small Spanish and British teams raced to destroy all the French ships and naval stores that they couldn't take with them. But amid the chaos of their departure, 18 ships of the line were allowed to fall back into French hands. A badly missed opportunity. Many French citizens of Toulon were desperate to escape aboard the Allied ships, knowing that the Republicans would inflict terrible reprisals on the city. British and Spanish ships took as many as they could, about 14,000 in all, but scores were drowned amid chaotic and desperate scenes. Others were left to face the wrath of the revolution. Republican troops entered the city the next morning, and executions and firing squads began almost immediately. Wow, what is up with that? In the next two weeks, about 200 were executed every day. Allied propaganda later blamed Bonaparte for the atrocities, but there's no evidence he was directly involved. France's young republic was now fighting back on all fronts. And with the fall of Toulon, the Allies had lost a golden opportunity, a chance to stir up further revolt, deal a lasting blow to French naval power, perhaps even overturn the revolution. But instead, the French Republic had weathered one of its greatest storms. In no small part, thanks to the remarkable judgment energy and courage of one 24-year-old artillery officer, now promoted Brigadier General in recognition of his extraordinary service at Brigadier Toulon. General! Napoleon Bonaparte had taken his first step on the path to greatness. And for Europe, 21 years of almost constant war awaited. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder, did people like him actually love a war or something? Because, I mean, he was out there too, so does he, is he, does he like that uh, organized chaos or something, an adrenaline rush or something? You know what I mean? 21 years of fighting, man. That's crazy. But anyway, uh, thank you guys for watching this with me. I'm glad I, I think I finally figured this out. So now we, we could just get into the Napoleon vibe and take it all. So uh, go ahead and keep watching, man. Just click right there and keep watching. Ben's watching that bad boy and take it, take it, you know what I mean? And uh, in the meantime, while you're all watching that, take care of each other, okay? Cool runnings.